Hi everyone and welcome to AXA Coral Live. It's fantastic to have you all with us. Now, for those of you who have joined in previous years, you will know that we normally broadcast from the Kamabi Research Station in Curaçao. Now, for those students watching, where we're based is at what's called the Field Research Station. And it's a really, really cool place to do science. That's because it's got those, those sort of three elements. It's got the field, and the field is what we as scientists call the sort of habitat, the nature that we're studying, in this case, the coral reef, and that's just offshore. It's got research, so it's got all the labs, all the equipment, all those different bits and pieces that you need to do science experiments. So you might go and collect some samples from the coral reef and then do further experiments in the, in the laboratory. And then that last word, station, that means it also has living quarters for visiting scientists. So we've got scientists here from all sorts of different countries, from, from Australia, from the USA, from uh, Germany, from the Netherlands. So it's a really great place uh, to be based uh, for Coral Life. Unfortunately, we've had big changes this year because of the coronavirus. And it's been wonderful that the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth in the UK is hosting this first week of Coral Live. And I'm here at what I like to call the Predator Zone. And today is all about amazing underwater predators and especially the shark. But before we get into the lesson, I can see that we've got uh, students joining from the UK, USA, France, India, Ireland, uh, Spain, Bermuda, and Canada. And a few shout outs to you guys. It's a big hello from Brittany, France. Uh, looking forward to learning more about our oceans. Um, so fantastic. Don't forget, there is a French lesson tomorrow morning as well. So do join that um, if you can. Um, we've got Mr. Dennison and Mr. John's class uh, from Irby Church Linden Primary School in Cumbria. Fantastic to have you all back and they're back again um, as we're enjoying it uh, so much. Fantastic to have you with us. Um, we've got class five at Lee uh, Primary School. Brilliant to have you with us and we're lovely having you uh, part of Coral Live. Now we've got, I'm just watching out and see if a shark goes past my back. It's a little bit unnerving. Um, Acre Rig Academy, um, year six, are chilling in the hall. Um, so chilling in the hall, sleeping with the sharks. Um, we'll, we'll find out um, how it's all going. Um, hi from Newtham um, uh, in Scotland. We're enjoying learning about coral, but can't wait to see more. Um, fantastic. We've got um, Axolotl's class at Manor Primary in Upfield. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, Penthorpe in West Sussex. Hi, everybody. Uh, all the boys and girls at St Anne's Catholic Primary School in Chelmsford Wood. And you have apparently been working incredibly hard. So massive well done to you uh, from your teachers. Um, we are, we've got class two at the primary school. Hi. Um, class four at Whittington Primary and Derbyshire. Hello. Um, big hello to all the year six children at Trimley St. Martin Primary School in Suffolk. Hi, year six. Great to have you with us. Um, and just a few more. We've got Carmel Primary School in Glasgow. Uh, we've got homeschoolers, um, Emmy, Posey, and Michael. Hi, everybody uh, watching from Glasgow and from home. And we've got grade three at the American School in Bilbao. And it's fantastic to have you back with us. And apparently, you're eager to learn more. Really, really fantastic stuff today. It's all about adaptation, a science word, and sharks somewhere behind me. So much like when we're in the Arctic, I have people, students watching from around the world, make sure I'm not eaten by a polar bear. Please get onto the live chat and warn me if a shark is going to come up and eat me. We hope that that's not going to happen. Which brings me to the live chat. On the side of your screen, um, you may see the chat box. That's um, for students to ask adults to put any questions or comments in. 
we were really asking this is a primary um, age live lesson. And so please get an adult if you're at home, a parent, carer, guardian, if you're at school, a teacher, to put those in for you. Uh, and we'll try and answer as many as possible, but don't forget the sharp warning, and that will come back to me. So, without further ado, uh, we're going to talk about sharks and adaptation. Before we get into the sharky bit, um, I'm going to be joined in just a bit um, by Joe, one of the schools officers here, who's going to take you through a few minutes and introduce you to some of our sharp tooth friends um, swimming behind me. But I'm going to talk, first of all, about this science word, adaptation. And I wonder if some of you have already heard this in a science lesson at school. Adaptation is basically the word that you use in biology to talk about the behavior or features of an animal or other living thing that makes it more suited to where it lives, to its habitat. And you see different adaptations for different things. Some adaptations you might see that help a creature get food. Some adaptations to stay safe and avoid being eaten. And other adaptations just to, just to survive in very harsh environments and climates. Examples could range from a polar bear with its white fur to camouflage it on the sea ice as it tries to hunt seals. Going somewhere hotter, you may have something like a camel with its amazing long eyelashes that it uses to keep the sand out of its eyes. Or if it goes to the other pole and meets some penguins with two types of feather, one cozy duvet downy feather and then a slicker oil-based feather as like a waterproof jacket to stop it getting soggy as it dives into the cold waters of Antarctica. But we're going to come not to the, but to sharks and work out how they are so suited to being the apex predator, the top predator of this underwater world. So we're going to talk about a number of different adaptations, but the first thing that I'd like to talk about is the shape of sharks. And we're going to do a little test here. So I'm going to just introduce this test and for you to complete later. And we thought you'd like to have a bit more of a look at the shark, so we'll give them some more time to that. But I'm just going to sort of move slightly out of the way and see who swims past. So this is our predator tank. And just think about some of the shapes of the different fish as they swim past. Now, to do this test and to be a good scientist, I've got to make sure it's a fair test. And a fair test means that I only change the thing that I'm looking to test, in this case, shape. And I try to keep everything else the same. So, I'm going to take these bits of plasticine. And I've got four different pieces of plasticine and I, or modeling clay. And I have to make sure that the only thing I change is shape. So all of these are made from the same type of material. And they're the same size and mass. If I wanted to be even more scientific, I could use a mass balance or scales and weigh each one of them to make sure they're exactly the same. So this test is looking at the speed through water of different shapes. So what we're going to do is make a different shape from 
each of these balls of plasticine or modeling clay and then drop them through water, so hold them on the surface of your water tank and see the speed at which they go. We can also use another science skill here, and that's observations, and another one of measuring. But first of all, I'm going to choose my different shapes for these imaginary sharks, and we'll think about which ones might be first. So the first one, I'm being inspired by a ray behind me. I'm going to make this pancake-like shape, and this is going to be the pancake shark of Palau. That's the first one we're going to have. I'm going to think of another shape to have. And I'm going to go for oof, a cube. I think a cube is going to be the best next shape. So here we are. Here's my cube. And this is going to be my cube shark of Curacao. Maybe I've just seen a puffer fish or a box fish somewhere around that's inspired me to make a cube shape underwater. The next shape I'm going to make is I'm going to make a sort of diamond shape. Um, and that's quite like um, a very cool fish, which I quite like a trigger fish, a bit like some of these hermits uh, behind me, a bit. So this is going to be the trigger fish of Tobago. There we are. And last, but by no means least, I'm going to make a shark, more a sort of torpedo, torpedo shaped. Uh, I might even make it a bit more like a, a shark's sort of shape. That's my really bad, Eddie's going to be, Eddie who's producing, Joe, who's behind the camera at the moment, they're going to be absolutely disgusted um, by my very, very bad shark shape. <laughs> yeah. I hope it's wonderful, better, Jamie. Better, better shark shape than that. Um, so there we go. And the test is, we don't, sadly don't have time to go through it all today, we're prioritising uh, some of these creatures behind you. You can see this magnificent tarpon down here, and it's a sleek, speedy shape in our predator, predator zone at the National um, Marine Aquarium. So, what have we got here? So, what we do is drop each of these shapes and time the speed at which they go through, or the time uh, the each shape and to see which hits the bottom a sort of set distance faster and through that we can calculate the i'm just gonna so we've got a tail there of of a nurse shark just coming past it crept up on me thank you everybody for warning me of course that there's a shark behind my um bum that was a really great early warning so we'll have to practice that um going forward so just to finish off on the um, on the on the fair test side, before I hand over to Joe, what we're looking at is how and why um, we have this very different shapes for different kinds of feeding behaviour, and we have a test to be able to sort that out. Now, the shape of a shark isn't the only way that it's adapted to being one of the top predators in our ocean. It's been around for about 400, 450 million years, potentially even longer. So in the ocean, um, when we had dinosaurs roaming the planet. And to show you some of the other adaptations and to answer some of your questions, hopefully give you a better view of some of the sharks in the tank behind me. I'm going to leave you with a short video to think about their features and hand over to Joe, schools officer at the National Marine Aquarium. Hello, 
Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, we're here at the National Marine Aquarium, and as Jamie said, behind me there are all sorts of different sharks. And fingers crossed, at some point, one of them is going to cruise past me, and we can talk a little bit about it. For now, though, we think of sharks, and we might have a picture in our head. Uh, so what I would like you to do is just close your eyes for a moment, and really imagine a shark in front of you. Think about its shape, think about its colour, Perhaps where its fins lie on the body, of course, its teeth as well. In your heads, you might be thinking of something a little bit like a great white shark. And perhaps this is the most famous shark of all. Lots of people have heard of the great white shark before. But did you know there's actually over 450 different species of shark on our planet? And they come in so many different shapes and sizes. You have the mighty whale shark, which is absolutely enormous. It reaches a whopping 12 meters in length. That's twice as big as a great white. And at the other end of the scale, you have the teeny tiny dwarf lantern shark. As a full grown adult, the dwarf lantern shark gets to about 20 centimeters long. That's like the size of your hand. They live in almost every habitat. We find them under the Arctic. Oh, we've got a little way, oh, we've got a nurse shark cruising by us here. Nurse sharks from the Caribbean, as they like to live in warm tropical seas. As I'm saying, they can live under the ice caps in the Arctic. We even get them here in the UK. There are 28 different sharks that live around the UK. But what actually makes a shark, what makes it different from other animals, what makes it this incredible uh, predator in our oceans? Well, sharks are fish. This means they are vertebrates, so they have a backbone, they have a spine all along their back. They have gills to breathe underwater. If one of our sharks come by, you can see gills on the side of the head. You might be able to see on some fish here gills breathing in water. And of course, they have fins, and these fins help propel them, allowing them to chase prey and to catch up with their food. But one thing makes them different from these fish which you see behind me. We might describe these fish behind me as bony fish, but sharks don't have any bones at all. Instead of bones, they've got something we call cartilage. We have cartilage in our ears, so if you grab your ears, give your ears a little wiggle around for me, they're really, really bendy. And they're really bendy because instead of being made of bone, like your arm, they're made of this soft cartilage. And shark's entire body are made of this cartilage. It makes them really bendy and really fast in water. And probably most importantly, it means they use much less energy than bony fish so much easier to move around. But one of the things people think about all the time when they think of sharks is their teeth. Sharks have fantastic teeth. Uh, when you think of sharks' teeth, you might be imagining something a little bit like this. Hold right there. You might be imagining something like these sharp jaws here. This fantastic set of teeth are from a tiger shark. So an animal like this would have been almost five meters long, which is huge. If you see any sharks a bit behind us, they'd be twice as big as any of the animals behind us in this tank. These sharks are quite well known for eating pretty much whatever they can find. That might be fish or squid. It might be other sharks or even bigger things like whales and dolphins. To be able to eat all of these animals, if I move just a little bit closer, you might be able to see they've got sharp teeth. Kind of like a knife, if you're using a knife and fork at home. And these sharp serrated teeth, they have tearing chunks off the animals. You might have seen sharks on TV before, shaking their head around as they grab their food. And they're shaking their head so you can tear chunks off with all these serrated teeth. But not all sharks have teeth like this. And this is 
because they're eating different things that have different prey. Some sharks, like the sands type shark, which fingers crossed, you might see behind us at any moment. The sand type shark have really pointed triangular teeth, a little bit like this one. If I move this really, really close, you can see those pointed teeth there. What I think is amazing about the sand type shark though, is if I turn this sideways slightly, being forward, you can see all the rows in behind. And sharks have many, many rows of teeth. And these rows of teeth are always rotating forward. So they're moving towards the front. You can see this one here. It's a little bit like having a wobbly tooth. If you've got a wobbly tooth at the moment, it's about to fall out of the shark's mouth. But instead of like a human being, the shark ended up with a gap in its mouth. The next tooth is already there and it's filling that space. So they never have any gaps at all. And this is one way that we know so much about sharks because their teeth are constantly dropping out of their mouth and falling to the ocean floor. Sharks from millions of years ago, the only thing left behind is their teeth. So we know so much about prehistoric sharks from teeth scientists have found in the seabed. So I'll pop that on there, just down on the side. And of course, teeth is one of the ways which sharks uh, are recognised. People instantly think of those amazing, powerful teeth. But we said they're an apex predator. That means they are right at the very top of the food chain. They're fantastic at hunting other animals. So they've got to have other adaptations to help them to do this. One of these adaptations are to do with the shark's senses. They have superb senses. And often these senses are better than even our own. So we can smell and taste and hear and see and touch with our hands. But sharks have a bonus sick sense. All around their nose and all around their eyes, they have these little black pores little black dots all over their snout. These black dots are called electroreceptors. And the electroreceptors can do something incredible. They can sense electricity, which is amazing. It makes sharks almost like a superhero. They can sense that electricity in water. But where does the electricity come from? Well, if you take your hand, pop it on your heart, and you might have some sharks can pass now. With your hand on your heart, you can feel your heart beating. And every time your heart beats, it gives off the tiniest little bit of electricity. As human beings, we don't have electroreceptors, electroreceptors so we can't sense that. But as the sharks cruise behind me, they're sensing the electricity given off by my heart. And they can sense that in their minds, which is amazing. Because if you're a fish and you're hiding in the sand, you're covered up by the seaweed, you think you're pretty smart. Sharks can't see you, they can't smell you, they can't hear you, but they can still sense that that fish is there through the electricity given off by its heart. One of the most amazing sharks to do this is the sawfish. Uh, and the sawfish do this by using their great big long nose. If that's hard to imagine, I've got one right here. Their noses are pretty big. Here we go. This is called a sawfish rostrum, and it goes on the end of the shark's nose, a little bit like this. And all the way along, the length of this nose is covered in these black dots called electroreceptors. So the sawfish takes its great big long nose, that long rostrum, it sweeps it across the seabed. And as it's sweeping it from left to right, that rostrum is sensing any beating hearts of animals buried in the sand. Once it senses the electricity given off by one of those animals, these great big teeth on the side are perfectly adapted for digging in the sand trying to find some tasty prey. 
fantastic. So we have some amazing senses. We have fantastic teeth. Hopefully, we'll see some sharks behind us in a moment. Uh, we've seen some rays go by. Uh, rays are quite closely related to sharks. In fact, rays are a little bit like getting a shark and squashing it flat. They're cousins of sharks, so they share lots of similar features. Uh, we have the great big round rays, which you might have seen coming by just a moment ago. These are called southern stingrays. Stingrays have a brilliant adaptation, which of course is the sting in their tail. If one of these stingrays come by, you'll see about halfway along its tail, my arm here, its tail, about halfway along a little bit, pokes up. And that bit poking up, that's the stingray's barb. And the stingrays only use it if they're really, really scared, if they're threatened by another predator. That tail will come up over its head, it will wave it around, thrashing about, and it's trying to scare away that predator. That bark's wrapped in a little sack of poison, toxins. Uh, so not only does it stab or try to cut the predator, but it can release those toxins as well uh, for extra damage. And that helps to keep the stingray safe. Brilliant. Uh, I think we've got some questions coming through. Uh, so I'm just looking over to my right here at some questions. Uh, all the while, I'm going to be peering behind me for those sharks, uh, much anticipated sharks, which I really hope appear in a moment. Um, I'm just going to have a little look to see what questions we have. Um, so, from Trevor Bart Primary, we have Do you think there are more species of shark to be discovered? That is a brilliant question, uh, and something which I think is really, really exciting, because there are definitely more sharks to be discovered out there. Scientists estimate that we've only explored about 10% of the ocean. And whenever scientists go on deep sea expeditions, right down to the depths of the deep sea, where it's really dark and we haven't been very often, they're always discovering new creatures. So I'm pretty certain that there's going to be other sharks out there which we just haven't seen before. I think that's amazing, because if we think about all the sharks we know and have seen in the world so far, there's probably all sorts of weird and wonderful sharks with strange adaptations, with strange shapes and features. Really great question, that. From... Um, what we've got here. From Trimley, St. Martin Primary, we have, what is the most common type of shark in the UK? Brilliant. Again, people don't think we have lots of sharks in the UK, but we do. I said before we have 28 species of shark. One of the most common types is the cat shark. Uh, if I lean forward, you might just get a little tail of another shark cruising by. Uh, the cat shark, it's one of the most common types we have in the UK. It doesn't get very big at all. It gets about 70 centimetres, this sort of size. Lots of people know it as a dogfish. Uh, so you can catch them um, because they live quite close to the shore. So sometimes fishermen might catch them. Um, instead of being all grey in colour, they're all speckly. It's like they come in spots. They're the, one of the most common types in the UK. Let's have a look what else we have here. Uh, another one from Trimley St. Martin Primary. What is the hardest material a shark can bite through? Yeah, really, really great, great question. Uh, sharks have an enormously powerful bite. Um, I have to say, they don't have the most powerful bite in the ocean. That would go to saltwater to a crocodile, which has one of the most powerful bites in the animal kingdom. Um, the sharks, uh, particularly the tiger shark, have been found with all sorts of strange things in its stomach, which they've eaten. Um, off the top of my head, I'm sure I've read that a tiger shark has eaten a wardrobe before. I don't know how the wardrobe got in the sea, but that was found inside the tiger shark. Amazingly powerful bite. Uh, some other ones we've got. Um, I'll take one last one from um, Trimley St. Martin. Um, what is the biggest shark in the tank behind me? So in this tank, uh, our largest shark is our lemon shark. Our lemon shark here is called Citra. 
He's a really, really old shark. He is the oldest shark we have here at the National Marine Aquarium. He's about, we think he's about 35 years old, maybe even a little bit older. At the moment, we've never met an aquarium which has an older lemon shark. So he might be the oldest lemon shark in the world. Citroen is just over two meters long, almost two and a half meters. So he's a pretty big shark with a great big head. Unfortunately though, in his old age, he is looking a bit gummy now. So he doesn't have lots of teeth you can see at the front. Poor old Citroen. Um, what else do we have? Um, Emma, Fuzi, and Micah say, what is your favorite type of shark and why? Great question. There are so many to choose from, but my personal favorite isn't one of the big sharks. I really like quite a small shark called an epaulette shark. They're long and slender, with a big black spot just by their gills. And I think the epaulette sharks are amazing because instead of swimming like all the other sharks do, they've got really strong fins on the side of their body and they actually walk on the ground. So if you ever see an epilep shark moving in the sea, it kind of looks like it's doing a little dance. It's like wiggling in amongst the corals around the coral reef. They're brilliant. Definitely check out the epilep shark. Um, we have uh, why are sharks in the sea near Devon? Uh, that's from Oscar. Why are sharks in the sea near Devon? Well, sharks live in all parts of the ocean, all around the world. Um, so some sharks really like warm waters, places like the Great Barrier Reef in the Caribbean. You find lots of different sharks there. But some do prefer the cooler seas. We have the second largest shark in the world, the basking shark. Is at our shores here in Devon. And that's because cooled water has lots and lots of plankton. The basking shark has an enormous mouth and it goes through the waters of Devon with its mouth open really wide. And it's eating as much plankton as it can possibly get. So Devon is a great place for the basking shark because it's so full of plankton. Great questions, keep them coming. Uh, we have how many teeth do sharks have? Um, of course, yeah, because we love the teeth. Um, it will take me ages and ages to count all the teeth in this shark's mouth here. At any one point, uh, a shark might have a hundred or so teeth in its mouth, but the amazing thing is how many teeth it goes through in its life. Remember before I said that the front teeth drop out and they're replaced by the teeth behind. This means that over the course of its life, a shark can lose thousands of teeth, if not tens of thousands of teeth. We estimate that the sand tigers behind us might lose as many as 20,000 teeth in their lifetime, which is an amazing number. Imagine if you lost 20,000 teeth. It's a lot of work for the tooth there, isn't it? Uh, we have from Linton Primary School, do sharks eat humans? Great question. That's one we hear all the time, isn't it? You know what? To a shark, you taste gross. You taste really, really disgusting. And that's because as human beings, we have too much iron in our blood. And sharks don't really like that. They much prefer the oily flesh of a fish. So sharks, sometimes might accidentally attack a person and often this might be uh, from mistaking a human for another creature perhaps they mistake it for something like a seal or a dolphin especially if you're in a wetsuit or on a surfboard sometimes a shark might just not know what you are and come along and have a taste bite of course that's not great for us as a human being but the sharks don't want to eat you they just don't know what's going on Shark attacks, though, are really, really rare. We just hear about them lots and lots because when they do happen, they often are, are taken on by the media and we do hear about them all over the world. But if you're in the waters, you're normally pretty safe. Uh, shark attacks don't happen very often. Let's have a look. What else do we have? Uh, do sharks eat coral? Cool, that's from Leah, Leah Primary School. Um, 
Do sharks eat coral? Good question. Um, at the moment, as far as I know, uh, sharks don't eat coral. Uh, most of the time, sharks are carnivores, so they're eating other fish, they're eating squid, they're eating other sharks, they're eating other animals swimming around in the sea. Sometimes, there's not many, very many cases of it, but sharks might eat plants. So really recently, scientists have discovered that the bonnethead shark, which is a really small hammerhead, has uh, been eating seagrass. And that's the first time scientists discovered a shark eating plants. So at the moment, it's not known. Uh, we haven't found any examples where sharks are eating corals. But remember, it was only recently that they discovered the bonnethead ate seagrass. So there's just so much about the ocean which we don't know yet. And that's pretty exciting because there's loads to learn. Um, what fish do sharks eat and how many types of sharks are there? Uh, and that's from Sophia and Jacob at Earby Primary. Um, what fish do sharks eat and how many are there? Uh, so right at the very start, if you cast your minds back, we said there are at least 450 different sharks in the world. But scientists are discovering new ones, uh, particularly in the deep sea, where we just haven't explored much. But what sort of fish do sharks eat? All sorts. Again, it depends whereabouts on our planet you're thinking. Uh, sharks in the middle of the ocean might eat kind of these big silver fish, like the ones behind me. Um, larger sharks, like the tiger shark, might try to eat one of these tarpon, or perhaps one of these big groupers behind me. Smaller sharks, though, um, like our nurse sharks, they might eat um, clams and shelled uh, animals. Um, even right down to the tiny cat sharks, which eat small crabs and other invertebrates. So it totally depends what sharks we're talking about. Let's have a little look. Who else do we have? Um, we have Noah says, would you would like to know why I like sharks? Yeah, that's a really great question. Why do I like sharks? Um, I think they are, they are fantastic for our ocean. They do a brilliant job of keeping our ocean really, really healthy. It's one of the reasons why sharks are just so important for our planet. Remember I was saying about the electroreceptors, being able to sense electricity from the water through the heartbeat. Well, sharks use this sense to sense animals in the ocean which are sick and which are poorly. And this means that if there's a poorly fish, sharks can come along and gobble it up. And it stops that fish from spreading its disease or spreading its sickness to other animals in the ocean. So sharks do an amazing job of keeping our oceans really clean and really healthy. Uh, and they're almost like the guardians of our sea, keeping it uh, as perfect as it can be. I think that's one of the main reasons I really, really like sharks. Great question, Emma. Uh, we have from Sydenham Prep, year six, they ask, what is the most streamlined shark? Cool. Uh, so remember, Jamie was saying about this nice slender body to be able to move through the ocean really quickly. Um, I guess the best example of this is the Mako shark, which is the fastest shark in the sea. It's so perfectly adapted to go really, really quickly. So it's this amazing slender body, these really powerful fins to propel it through the ocean. Uh, so if we're going purely on speed, I would say the Mako shark is probably the most streamlined. Good question there uh, from the year six class. How do sharks keep their skin clean? Uh, and that is from uh, Jiro and Koji from the Home Ed group. Uh, how do sharks keep their skin clean? Yeah, great question. Uh, I really like that one because sharks don't have skin like we do. If you pop your arm up and feel your skin, whatever direction you move your hand, it's nice and smooth. Smooth this way, smooth this way. You could do little circles. But sharks have really, really strange skin. Their skin is called dermal denticles, which literally means skin teeth. 
Uh, and it's the same for rays as well. You might see the ray just over my shoulder there. Uh, it means skin teeth. And that's because if you looked under a microscope, shark skin is made up of thousands and thousands of tiny little teeth. So if you're feeling particularly brave and you ran your finger or ran your hand from the nose of a shark all the way along to its tail, you'd have a uh, be really, really smooth and really, really streamlined. Oh, look at this ray just next to me here. If I ran my hand along the ray here, it'd be super smooth, nose to tail. But if I went from its tail and looked all the way back up to its head, I might end up with loads of scratches and loads of cuts to my hand. And that's because their skin is made of these tiny little teeth called dermal denticles. And some scientists have discovered that the shape of these dermal denticles actually makes it really, really hard for parasites and small bugs and creatures uh, in the ocean to actually stick to the shark. So it's the shape of their skin actually helps to keep them clean. In some cases, though, uh, sharks might have um, another animal uh, which comes along to clean them. Um, in somewhere like the Great Barrier Reef, you get really, really small creatures called cleaner ass. Uh, they're about the size of my finger. They're really tiny. And it's the cleaner ass's job to go from head to tail, cleaning the animals, including sharks. They'll go all over its skin and eat any parasites on the shark's skin. But the cleaner ass will even go inside the shark's mouth and clean out all its teeth. And the sharks sometimes open up their gills and the cleaner ass goes inside its gills and cleans its gills as well. Uh, so yeah, a couple of different ways sharks can keep their skin clean. Great question there. Let's have a look. Uh, Oliver wants to know if sharks can see in the dark. Uh, yeah, brilliant, especially those sharks which live really, really deep in the ocean. Um, some sharks might have really large eyes, and that means if there's only a little bit of light uh, making its way down to the deep, they might just be able to see. But for the animals living really, really deep, they rely more on their sense of smell, their sense of hearing. And that's how they hunt in the dark depths of the ocean. An animal like the Greenland shark, which lives under the ice caps in the Arctic, where it's often quite dark, can barely see at all. Uh, they're almost totally blind. So they're completely reliant on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing to work out where their prey is and also to avoid predators. Good question then. Um, uh, do sharks have eyelids? Yeah, uh, fish don't have eyelids, which to us as human beings sounds really, really weird. So fish can't close their eyes at nighttime when they go to sleep. Uh, if you see some vast sharks when they're fast asleep, they still have their eyes open, so it looks like they're awake, but they're cruising really, really slowly. It looks like they're barely moving their tanks going along in one direction. Weirdly, uh, sharks, uh, some sharks, uh, can't stay still. They have to swim their entire lives. Sharks like our sand tiger sharks. And when they're sleeping, uh, they can't lie down in a coral reef or lie down on the seabed. They have to keep swimming their entire lives. And that makes it really difficult because you know, they don't want to, they want to be able to go to sleep at some point. So for a sand tiger shark, they have half their brain sleep at a time. So one half to sleep and the other half to wake, just keeping them going in one direction. And then it swaps over. So the other half is sleeping and the other half is just getting them uh, cruising along in the water, keeping them aware to make sure there's no predators about. Hopefully, in the final remaining minutes, we'll see a sand shark, um, but maybe not, unfortunately. Um, we are running out of time, though, so we'll do the last couple of questions, uh, and then we'll finish up. See these last questions here. Um, we have, uh, how deep can sharks swim? Uh, that's from Linton Primary School. Uh, literally thousands of meters down into the ocean, uh, which is amazing. Um, the deepest point of our ocean uh, is over 10 kilometers deep. Imagine driving in a car for 10 kilometers on a road and then go down instead. 
That's deeper than Mount Everest is tall. At the moment, sharks haven't been found quite that deep. Oh, we just saw a sand tiger bite. You're going to see that. Uh, hopefully, they do a big loop and come back round. Uh, I'm going to look over my shoulder and see if we can see it. Uh, sharks haven't been found quite that deep, but thousands and thousands of meters down in the dark depths of the ocean. Have a little peer around to see if I can see a sand tiger shark just before we finish up. I'll do this last question and then we'll go. Um, we have, we have. Um, what are the biggest and the smallest sharks? Uh, as our final question. Um, oh, look, we've got a sandbar just coming by this way. That really sleek body we were talking about earlier on. Um, but final question um, it was the dwarf lantern shark, which is the smallest. Remember, it's the size of your hand, so it's not very big at all, maximum of 20 centimeters, right up to the whale shark and a whopping 12 meters long. That's a big shark. Brilliant. One last look to see if any sharks are about. Um, but I think it's just going to be the sand tiger and the sandbar at the end there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that is all we have time for. If you have submitted questions, uh, then on the next uh, showing, uh, later on today, uh, we'll answer those questions as well to come back to that last showing um, to hear all those questions and many more. Otherwise, from myself and from Jamie earlier on, I want to say a massive thank you for joining us. Uh, for this session. Um, I certainly really enjoyed hearing all your questions uh, and taking on your comments there. So thank you very much. Uh, and hopefully see you again for another one of our Coral Live sessions uh, later on in the week. Thank you all very much and goodbye.